Coming up on DTNS, the U.S. accuses Huawei of racketeering. That's the same thing they charged Al Capone with. 3D printing in tens of seconds. This stuff is interesting. And Justin's got a new tech election puzzler for us. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 13th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And back at Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the shores of Lake Merritt, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just uh, talking about uh, the weird problems that Sarah Lane's been having with her magic keyboard connectivity, but also why Justin Robert Young had been training all his life to dress up as a Charmander at the 2016 Republican National Convention. That's all part of Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A judge has ordered a temporary block on the $10 billion Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure, or JEDI, Pentagon cloud contract, which was awarded to Microsoft back in October. Now, last month, Amazon filed a motion asking the court to pause Microsoft's work, claiming the evaluation process contained unmistakable bias and has since asked the court for permission to depose the U.S. President Donald Trump, Defense Secretary Mark Esper, and former Defense Secretary James Mattis. So certain were they. Mm, Foxconn told the Taipei Stock Exchange that reports by Reuters that it would be back to 80% capacity in mainland China by March were not factual. Meanwhile, Nikkei Asian Review's a source said that uh, it will take one to two months for Foxconn to resume manufacturing. In a related note, Apple will reopen five stores in Beijing Friday, February 14th, with reduced hours. Apple stores in Shanghai and Shenzhen remain shut. Wi-Fi 6E is the name for 802.11ax operation in the 6 gigahertz band. That gives you more than 2 gigabits per second speeds. Thursday, Broadcom announced the BCM4389 client Wi-Fi 6E chipset available for next-generation smartphones. Lower power consumption, multi-radio Bluetooth 5.0 support to improve audio performance and range. So to sum up, look for smartphones later this year with Broadcom chipsets that offer faster Wi-Fi and better Bluetooth. And also look for Qualcomm to release its Wi-Fi 6E chipsets pretty soon. U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is the latest U.S. legislator to propose a national law on digital privacy. Her bill proposes a new federal agency to enforce consumer privacy rights online. It would not preempt state laws, meaning that it would not create national standards for privacy in the U.S., it's similar to proposals from U.S. Representatives Anna Eshoo and Zoe Lofgren, as well as, from, as well as from U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell. A bipartisan proposal from Representatives Jan Chakowsky and Kathy McMorris-Rogers don't include state preemption. And Uber is testing an option to let you book a ride by phone in Arizona by dialing 1-833-USE-UBER. I want to see a TV commercial for this right now. Uh, it's meant for people who, you know, not comfortable with smartphones. Maybe they're older. Operator gives them a price estimate and order a car based on their details and then texts them information about the car and driver. So person calling does have to have text messaging. Uber stores your payment data the same way it would through the app. All right. Let's talk a little bit about another Senate proposal. What's this one about, Justin? Well, Tom, U.S. Senators Cory Booker and Jeff Merkley proposed the Ethical Use of Artificial Intelligence Act Wednesday that would stop the use of facial recognition without a warrant by federal agencies, government employees, and law enforcement until a 13-member congressional commission can recommend guidelines and place limits on the use of the technology. Yeah, this is... Um this is something that shouldn't surprise people with all the furor over facial recognition. Uh, but even if it is a political play, it does seem to me to be a fairly reasonable writing of it, saying, you know what, let's just put a pause on federal use until we figure this out. Let's set up a commission. Uh, we'll have different people be able to nominate people for the congressional commission. So we try to get a lot of different viewpoints on this and then and figure out what the rules of the road should be. One of the things people are taking issue with is they did carve out an exception in this proposal uh, for use of facial recognition with a warrant. Uh, they're saying if you have a warrant to use facial recognition, then you can. So that cuts out on it being used for for leads unless you're really serious. You have to go to a judge and get a warrant. Some people say, yeah, but it's still not good enough even for that. Depends on where you sit. 
Yeah, obviously there is a lot of discussion and I'm glad that this is happening out in the open. So as much as my knee jerk reaction to something like this is to say, wait a minute, something's in the news. Uh, uh, please do not stand between this story and senators who want airtime uh, as they will trample you. But I, I do think that there is a, a good public conversation that needs to be had about this. And even if it's ultimately ineffectual at least it is something that we're bringing up here and folks who are listening can talk to with their friends and family yeah and i guess the question at this point is i mean where does it go uh it it doesn't sound it sounds as you said tom fairly measured uh you know no no huge red flags but does it go anywhere yeah, does the what does the commission come up with? Do, you know, does that proposal go forward? Uh, part of the reason you put a pause on it though is there will be pressure from law enforcement and other agencies to to want to use it, so that'll keep it going forward. What they decide if this bill even gets approved, which it may not, yeah. uh, is a whole different thing. Well, as we reported on Wednesday's show, Mobile World Congress was canceled because the GSMA found it impossible to put the show on, despite health officials not requiring to actually be canceled. Most big names had pulled out already, leaving smaller companies without anything for the money that they spent in preparation and without the chance to make contacts and build awareness for their products. That's why a lot of people go to trade shows. In addition, many companies are facing other problems related to the Chinese coronavirus, which has shut down factories in China, meaning parts for their products are also delayed. Firms of all sizes are looking for alternate ways to make announcements and build relationships, including more smaller trips and meetings and independent press conferences. Now, I guess the question is now, even though the GSMA says it will hold the show next year, will some companies figure, hmm, we got through it okay, maybe we don't need to go? Yeah, that's the dangerous thing, right, is a lot of people think they have to go to something until they don't go and then realize, wait a minute, Nothing yeah, yeah. bad happened. I mean, as a CES veteran, <laughs> I've never been to <laughs> WMC, but I can tell you, I mean, a lot of work does not get done at, at various trade shows. I'm going to go ahead and guess that a lot of trade shows are that way. I mean, schmoozing isn't always just a waste of time. There, There is a lot of business being done, but I bet a lot of companies who think we have to be there uh, will figure, huh, well, our, our alternate... Um, uh, solutions ended up being more fruitful for us in the end. Yeah, I, I don't think that the, the issue is necessarily them not going, but them spending the kind of money that they would normally do to big the to be the big fish at a conference like that does potentially take a hit when you go without it and everything's kind of the same. Because I do agree with Sarah that a lot of what you get out of here is just having all the players in one space where you know you can trade information, build relationships, or make deals. But maybe buying that gigantic booth, a uh, different story. Maybe taking everybody out for those uh, a big, expensive, uh, curated experiences, maybe not so necessary. Yeah, and, and it's also hard on the smaller companies. Uh, with a lot of the big companies pulling out before they even canceled it, it was going to be more difficult for these smaller companies who were still going to go to, to find the kind of eyeballs and ears that they would want. But if they could get it from the press, or if they could make some deals with other small companies, it could have been worthwhile. Uh, and now they're going to have to figure out, okay, can we just spend a lot more money probably flying around to meetings in Europe and North America and China uh, to, to get our message out there and take meetings. It doesn't have the efficiency of just walking around in a conference and being able to meet up with people that maybe you wouldn't even met otherwise and, and striking deals. That That's what the value of a conference is, is those serendipitous things. And you can't really replace those. Whether it's worth that time and expense, though, uh, we will now have an A-B test for attendees of Mobile World <laughs> Congress to figure that out. The U.S. filed a superseding indictment against Huawei and its CFO, Meng Wanzhou. Uh, Meng Wanzhou, of course, is uh, in Vancouver under house arrest uh, while she awaits an extradition decision by the Canadian courts. Uh, but this supersedes previous indictments. It charges Huawei, uh, multiple versions of Huawei's business, and Meng Wanzhou with conspiring to violate the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, the RICO Act, uh, and conspiring to steal trade secrets. It also contains new allegations regarding violations of sanctions against North Korea and Iran. Those were some of the original indictments against Meng Wanzhou. Among the allegations are using confidentiality agreements with U.S. companies to obtain things like router source code. In other words, you'd strike a deal, say, yes, we'll keep this confidential. You look at the router source code, and then you misappropriate that uh, and put it in your own 
property uh, without permission. Uh, the indictment lists other concrete examples like distributing confidential slide decks to the engineers. You meet with a company under a confidentiality agreement, an NDA. You're not supposed to take that slide deck and pass it around the rest of the company. Huawei is accused of doing that. Uh, there's another example of someone at a trade show in Chicago with a badge that spelled Huawei backwards as their name being caught after hours opening up routers from the competition and taking pictures of the interior. Other in charges involved just lying to federal investigators, hiding employment status, saying, no, we're not employees of Huawei when they actually are. Um, I mean, this has to go to trial. These are accusations. They're, they haven't been proved. Uh, but this is a different kettle of fish than the backdoor accusations because we can see exactly what they're accusing. We can see evidence and it's going to be going to court. Uh, there's enough here to make me think like this is just an actual case that the U.S. wants to file because they've discovered wrongdoing. But, Justin, there is also a political aspect to this with the China trade deals going on. Uh, without a doubt. And, and and real quick, just so everybody understands, when you hear the term RICO, if it sounds familiar, it's because this is the tool that law enforcement often uses for organized crime. Uh, mm. So drug dealers or mafiosos. You don't, if you can't catch them on the dealing, you catch them on the racketeering. Well, yeah. And cause you can, you can prove by way of actions that spider outside of the actual person that you are looking to bring charges against. You can use those other crimes to charge the central person, but you're right, Tom, this is obviously in the large, very complicated, very personal at times negotiation of this trade deal. We already have a phase one that is done between the Chinese government and the United States government. But phase two, which is often thought to be the far more trickier one, involves at the top line trade secrets, which China has been accused by many, many companies of violating largely because America goes to China to manufacture so many products. But this is something that is even beyond that. They are not alleging that uh, Huawei was taking advantage of Chinese side manufacturing. They are saying that even beyond that, these were crimes that were being committed on American soil that, that, that they are coming back against them for. And we're not going to see uh, except for Meng Wanzhou, maybe, uh, if Canada agrees to extradite. Uh, we're not going to see most of Huawei's officials brought into the U.S. Uh, for this. Uh, what I'm curious about is whether this can or will be used uh, in the negotiations, if they end up dropping these charges in exchange for a trade deal, uh, or if this is just a solid enough thing to say, look, we're going to prosecute this no matter what. Uh, you, you want to stop doing this in the future if you want to get a trade deal from Yeah, it. I think part of me says this is them saying, look, we're going to start enforcing the rules. And so we can create new rules going forward. So this is easier and maybe we can have a an, an intermediary phase where we believe these things are happening and you're going to have to actually respond to us. Or this is going to be the thing that happens. But we're not, I mean, who knows whether or not they wipe away this sin when they start uh, creating a new uh, a new set of rules. Something we'll definitely want to keep an eye on. You know, Tom, last week we talked about the Jalopnik report that a man named Alec brought, uh, bought a used Tesla that he thought had enhanced autopilot and full self-driving features, only to find out that Tesla removed those features during an audit that showed he had not paid for the package, which, of course, he hadn't the original owner had that led to questions about whether Tesla was trying uh, was tying packages to the original owner. Well, Monday, Alec posted on Tesla Motor Club dot com uh, that everything is back to normal. He has also offered to act as a go between with Tesla's experience team uh, for others who might have the same issue. Tesla does these audits in order to correct for people uh, who have been given the package without paying by mistake, which has happened, or who modified uh, to get the package without paying, which has also happened. Tesla has not made a public statement on the issue or clarified its policy on the transfer of packages in used cars. When I saw the headline that he got his autopilot back, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Tesla is admitting this was a mistake and they're giving it back to him. Uh, once I read in that it was just Alex saying, hey, I got it back. Uh, I have the secret phone number if anybody wants it. Uh, and Tesla is not saying anything in public. Uh, I, I got less uh, happy about the outcome of this because I still believe what happened is Tesla is trying to stop 
uh, mistakes that they have made and malicious actors who are modifying without permission from getting these packages and aren't accounting for the fact that used car sales happen because they haven't happened historically a lot with Tesla uh, and they just caught, caught out on this. Why they're not coming out and saying that is evidence of disorganization, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the Tesla already got their money from the original owner. So I don't, I can't see a scenario where the company says, nah, it's just going to have to be original owner. And if you pay for something that you didn't pay, you know, extra for the package, even though we already got the money, we want it twice and you won't get it otherwise and we'll take it out of your car. That would be like, you know, if a company said, Sarah can't have air conditioning because she didn't get like, the cool package. Because you bought when, a used car. Because I bought a used car. I mean, I, I know that, yeah. you know, software is not the same as, you know, an AC unit, but it's the same idea. I think Tesla is probably, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we continue to make sure that <laughs> we're not giving people software packages that they didn't pay for and continue to deal with the fact that people, you know, play around with systems to try to get stuff for free. You're not going to be able to have much control over that used car market. You got your money. Well, I mean, I, the, the 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 one thing that they do need to clarify on this is that the the price of that car is going to be determined by the features. And so, if they're going to say, no, 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 we are doing this as a service, and you pay for it each time that there is a new owner, then that car is going to sell for different as a used car than it would be without it. So, there is a value for Tesla at a certain point if they do want to go to a no, every new user has to pay the pay the toll on this. They sh they they need to clarify it going forward. But this to me says, without saying that, no, once it's turned on, it's turned on. Sell your used car for more because of it. I'm imagining a PR manager uh, talking to someone saying, okay, but what's our policy? What can I tell people when I, and they're like, you can't tell them anything. We don't have a policy. We really should create right. one. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting at 4 p.m., everybody. Yeah. Scientists at Switzerland's EFPL have developed a 3D printer that can build an entire object at once in seconds rather than building it layer by layer, which obviously takes a lot longer than that. The printer shines a laser on a liquid photosensitive, photosensitive resin, e either biofuel or liquid plastic. Biogel, sorry, that's my fault. Biogel, I guess gel and fuel, nah, I guess not, uh, from multiple angles. And then an algorithm guides the laser to create a precise version of a 3D model. It can make two centimeter structures at 80 micrometer precisions right now. The team thinks it's capable of up to 15 centimeters. Printing can be done inside sealed sterile containers as well, which is useful for medical applications and the like. A company called Readily 3D has also been created to market the system. This is pretty impressive. I mean, this is peer reviewed in nature. Uh, it's It's got a company. Uh, they're going to bring this to market. It's very small. Uh, I get it. Uh, two centimeters. You're, you're not making a, you know, uh, uh, any Lego toys for your kids uh, with this. But uh, heart, heart valve, maybe, especially if they get it up to 15 centimeters. I mean, it's impressive how fast this stuff prints in this machine because it's just shooting into a liquid and creating the solid object. It's almost like a replicator, right? Except the liquid, the material is already there. It's not appearing out of anywhere. Yeah, when you uh, when you, when you kind of hear about this, you go, okay, 3D printing is getting faster. When you watch a video of how it works, you're like, wow, that's it's it feels like something is materializing out of thin air. Yeah, because it's it's the advancements in AI because the algorithm can be you know uh, can direct the lasers to exactly the right places so that it will in fact uh, create the solid objects at exactly the right places so it's much more precise. It can be used for interior decorating, they think, because you don't have to finish the item; they come out polished uh, mm. because you just make it perfect from the beginning. Sure. I, I think this is a pretty big advance. I'll, I'll be interesting to see where it goes. I know a lot of people in the three D printing uh, space. I will, you know, be annoyed with the fact that I'm like, whatever happened to 3D printing? And it was going to be, it was going to change everybody's lives. And I, I know that it is extremely helpful for lots of things uh, if you need to make something. But this seems like, okay, now we're really getting somewhere because it's almost instantaneous. To get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. In light of the failure of the app used in the Iowa caucus earlier this month in the United States, Nevada reportedly decided not to use that same app. But instead, they're using a tool. It's not an app, they say. At least sources say they say. 
Uh, it's a pre-installed tool on an iPad that's not connected to the internet, which I would also call an app, just one that's not connected to the internet or the one made by Shadow for the Iowa caucus. But there is in fact a difference. Uh, the Iowa app was meant to transmit the vote and delegate counts to the state. That's why it was internet connected. This Nevada iPad tool that volunteers are describing to various outlets seems to be for use only in the room to calculate the numbers, because calculating the numbers and collating all those numbers during the caucus is complex. Uh, so it's essentially, if I get this right, Justin, it's a glorified calculator. Yes, and here is one of the differences between uh, Nevada and Iowa. Nevada will begin early voting within the next few days. That means that at preset locations, you can go and caucus uh, of uh, about a week ahead of time. So at those precincts, those calculators will be preloaded theoretically with the early voting that would result in that would have gone at that precinct. This that is like telling your dungeon master, uh, here are all the things to do uh, during the game. I won't be there, right? Because a caucus we, we think of is like, you go to that corner of the room if you support that candidate. And, and what's happening sure. in the early voting, if I have it right, Justin, is you basically put down your choices in order. Like, I'm for this person, but if they don't survive the first round, then go to this person. But if that one's also not around, yet go to this person, et cetera. Exactly. So... Think of it, because we are in Vegas, uh, the mecca of gambling, that the pre-vote will be kind of like a, a point spread, the way that you would bet. In the way that if you see the Miami Dolphins against the Dallas Cowboys, the Miami Dolphins minus seven, that would be, let's say, Bernie Sanders. He will be minus seven because Elizabeth Warren has gotten seven votes, if that makes any sense. Sure. Uh, the, 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 what I want to ask everybody here is that let's imagine that we do live in 2020 and you do want to modernize and make the process of the, the, the caucus faster and cleaner. And so you do want to implement some kind of technology to make it easier for everybody, but you don't want to go full Iowa and have a total app meltdown disaster. By the way, an app that was initially bought by Nevada for this caucus, and apparently Nevada loved it so much they recommended it to Iowa. Uh -huh. I was then the one that had the exploding cigar. Uh, uh, so now Nevada has dropped it and has this new tool, but how do you handle it? Tom? Yeah, I mean, because the tricky part is you've got some complex math going on. Yeah. You don't want, I mean, it's, it's if you're like, just do it on paper, doing it on paper would be absolutely more complex than using a computer. We have computers. We're not talking about using the internet here. Uh, I think it would be silly not to use a computer somehow to do this because you're gonna have all these people who voted early and their ranked choices that you need to take into account in addition to the people standing in the caucus, right? Yeah. And so if I have, I don't know, an Excel spreadsheet that has all the early voting data in it, and I can just go in and fill in a form that says, okay, uh, for the first round in the room, add this many for this candidate, this many for that candidate, and then it calculates it, uh, that's great. Sounds like that's the idea for this iPad tool yeah. that isn't an app. Uh, but I don't know why you had to create something from scratch. There's so many tools that would do this and if you're going to be offline anyway, then it's just a matter of, you know, double checking to make sure that the data entry is correct uh, and that your people are trained on the tool. And you're already having to do that with the iPad tool. So why not use something that's proven? I don't know, like freaking Microsoft Excel. Now, the, the one thing that we I, I can tell you is that we don't know whether or not it is Excel. Maybe have, it is. We, right. We have no idea exactly what this particular tool is. We just know that it was. Uh, uh, precinct captains were trained on it last Saturday. Uh, that apparently was not a seamless process, at least according to all reports of those that were there. But at the very least, there is the there. There are a few things going for Nevada. Number one, a lot fewer people in Nevada go to caucuses than they do in Iowa. In Iowa, it is a cultural tradition. In Nevada, they've only been doing it since 2008. Number two, it happens a lot 
earlier. Check-in for caucusing is at 10 a.m., and the Ooh. caucus happens at noon. Now, it happens on a weekend, so you're mm -hmm. able to get out a little bit earlier. It's not like people will be leaving work unless, obviously, they have a tremendous service economy that works on the weekends there, especially oh, wait. in a popular city, right? But even then, the casinos are holding their own. People are going to be allowed to leave their shifts. So everybody, if you were going to be in Vegas that weekend, make sure you get at least two drinks at 11.55. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and we will of course, uh, wait to f hear, uh, how this app does. Uh, but if you have a suggestion, you're like, this is what they should do. Email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Hey, thanks everybody who participates in our sub Reddit. Also a good way to give us some feedback by submitting stories and voting on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and also joining in the conversation in our discord. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, actually, hold on. Breaking news. Literally breaking as we uh, are recording this. The Democrats of Nevada have released their full details of co the caucus day uh, process and will be using a Google Forms-based calculator via web browser on a party purchased iPad to transmit early <laughs> will also be called in, but this does contradict some of the, the early reporting saying that this was not internet enabled. It's, yeah, that Google Forms has to be internet enabled. Yeah, that it, I, it, I mean, it has an be, offline version. But. This will be transmitted via the internet, but I mean, geez, Louise, uh, thankfully they are using something that works at, at, at a massive scale for which the Nevada caucus will be but a hiccup. Uh, on on election day. Thank, bless you, Nevada Democratic Party. <laughs> Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, is back with us today with a timely tip for upcoming travelers. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. As we think about the trips that are getting canceled and the conferences that are getting canceled here because of the fear of the coronavirus, it is useful to remind people that this might be a good time to get travel insurance, especially trip interruption insurance or trip cancellation insurance. But also from a tech point of view, if you do get travel insurance from one of the leading travel companies, most of those companies also have an app. And it'd be good to have that with you on your trip. And that can help you access information about your insurance, but it also can, in some cases, help you reach someone to deal with things like, hey, I'm trapped on a cruise ship because they won't let us off at a port, which is what some people are going through right now, and see if you can make other travel plans. So get travel insurance, get the app. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Ah, timely, timely advice. Thank you, Chris. Let's check out the mailbag. Andrew wrote in and said, regarding our story on the remote speaker from Sony yesterday, you know, the one that lets you go into the next room and be able to take a speaker with you and not miss the big game. Uh, Andrew says, when I'm in the kitchen and I want to hear the TV in another room, I leave my phone in the lounge room and use Live Listen with my AirPods. Ah, oh, smart. Live Listen is the one that lets you hear through your device's mic. Uh, it's an accessibility feature. It's usually meant to be used by someone who's maybe a little hard of hearing or they're in a loud room and want to just be able to pick out voices better. Uh, what a what a cool uh, a workaround. Life hack, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, and then in the Discord right before the show, Ditch Doctor uh, wrote in regards to DTNS 3717 about gift card fraud. I am an independent IT consultant and have a few large churches as clients. Probably two to three times a week, we get emails sent to staff from Gmail accounts like... Pastor234 at gmail.com. I've had two people buy the gift cards the pastor asked for, but in both cases, they walked into the actual pastor's office instead of sending the codes to the criminals, uh, so the criminals didn't get the gift cards. I worked with the FBI on a couple of larger cases and found out how the criminals redeem the codes. They sell them at a discount, turning them into cash. So uh, that's what I said yesterday. When you're buying those discount gift cards online, be careful. Some of them are legit. Some of them are not. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Shane, Jeffrey Zilks, and Michael Kepper. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young. It was quite a political day here on DTNS. Justin, <laughs> uh, I, I assume there, there is more politics in your world. 
Well, you know, I was live and direct from New Hampshire uh, just yesterday. I got back after the primary. I will be in Las Vegas for the Nevada caucus. I'll then be in South Carolina and then back in California for Super Tuesday. If you want all of that coverage and uh, uh, specifically if you're at the three dollar level at TakePoliticsSeriously.com, you are getting uh, a multiple bonus episodes per week, uh, please. Head on over, takepoliticsseriously.com. And if you want to get on my newsletter, it's free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com. If you support us on Patreon, you not only get an ad-free feed in your RSS, but you also get bonus content. Uh, today's editor's desk had me talking about this very show and why we were maybe not going to pick a story about Michael Bloomberg and memes, but instead pick to talk about this Nevada app. If you want to hear that thought process as it was this morning at 8.30 a.m., right after texting with Justin Robert Young, uh, you got to get Editor's Desk, become an associate producer or a higher level at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And if you can join us live, we'd love to have you Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC, and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com. Len Peralta will be drawing during the show tomorrow, and Rob Dunwood will be here to talk about Microsoft Teams versus Slack. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>